Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm very pleased today to have Dr. Jennifer Harmon, who is an Associate Professor of Psychology at Colorado State University, join me. Uh, some of you may have seen her before because, because she was on the uh, documentary Erasing Families. And uh, she was the professor that was giving all the statistics and things like that. Uh, it was really nice to see some solid facts being presented in this very contentious issue. And so, Dr. Harmon, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, how did, what sparked your interest in looking at parental alienation? Um, well, a couple things. Um, first, I kind of, I started seeing it happening to some friends of mine and didn't really know what it was, which was really weird because somebody who was trained as a social psychologist and I specialized in the study of intimate relationships and when I came across what people were calling it, I was like, how come I've never heard of this? And I'm a scientist <laughs> who studies this. Uh, and then when I um, remarried, um, after I had gotten divorced and remarried, um, my husband was experiencing it. He was experiencing it before he met me, but it escalated after we met. And, um, and then I was just, I couldn't believe, you know, how it was working, like what was happening, how um the other parent was able to get away with a lot of the things that they were and how the kids were reacting and um and so seeing it kind of firsthand but even though it wasn't directly happening to me it, it was indirectly happening to me in the house <laughs> so uh so it was affecting him more it was definitely affecting me too because i was definitely a target you know that step parents always get the raw end of the deal anyway you know but um but alienated step parents it's really bad um and so I, I then started just kind of doing my own research on it. Um, I, and then I looked up people who were publishing in the area. And it turns out one of the people who, was, who had published a few papers actually had an office on the floor above me in my, my university. <laughs> and I actually had served on a couple committees with her, with her students. And so I reached out to her and I said, oh my gosh, I had no idea you published a few papers on parental alienation you know, what can you tell me, you know, this is what, and I described what was happening and, you know, we did, we were hoping to get maybe an expert on our case to go in and explain it to the court. Um, but she didn't really do that very much. And she said, we really need a lot more research on it. And I agreed. So she and I started collaborating. A lot of it was kind of early on just to help me cope and understand it better. Um, and it was a way for me to, you know, kind of deal with, you know, <laughs> with what was going on. It kind of helped me intellectually separate from what was happening a little bit and to just try to see it objectively, you know, which I think for me, it was a nice coping strategy. Um, and then the more I got into it, the more I started realizing there wasn't a lot of um, work from a social psychology perspective, which is what my training is. A lot of the focus has been on from legal perspectives or clinical perspectives, which makes sense because they're the ones in the front lines who are dealing with this, right? Um, and so then I thought, well, okay, where do we need to start? So I, I did a full, I read everything on the topic. I've read every article there is pretty much on alienation at this point. Um, and we interviewed, we just started interviewing parents. And that's how I started getting into it. We interviewed, I think we had almost a hundred parents we interviewed from around the world just to hear what was going on and get some ideas. Um, so I started with qualitative um, and I wanted to approach it kind of with a fresh mind, you know, somebody kind of who's not coming out from a clinical side and not, you know, and, and so then we wrote a book that summarized some of the research literature that we had come up with or had, a, had reviewed. And then I gave my impressions about what I kind of thought some of the ideas, some of the underlying drivers of it from a social perspective. Um, and then that fueled a lot of the questions that I raised in the book, then fueled a lot of my research questions. Cool. So, so that was back in 2016. And so that's been my whole research focus since then. Awesome. So, um, so in a nutshell, from your perspective, what exactly is parental alienation and how does one actually identify it from, say, estrangement? So parental alienation is when a child aligns with one parent and rejects their other parent for unjustified reasons. Um, so the reasons could be um, exaggerated or false or trivial, um, but they've essentially turned against a parent 
uh, and align with their other one. And it's usually done primarily through the influence of the parent that they're aligning with. Um, and what causes it are parental alienating behaviors of that parent and the social influence that they put on them. Um, and I think what's important to note is that in, in what my research is indicating and in, in, in several of the papers I've published recently is that this is no different than a coercively controlling parent. Um, so a parent who is, you know, another term that you might be more familiar with is a batterer or an intimate terrorist. Um, the kind of term that's sort of used today is coercively controlling violence. Um, and that's a different kind of violence than other kinds of more common, more common types of violence are things like what we call situational couple violence, where two people are just fighting all the time and, you know, they, they use, they push each other, they throw plates, but it's, 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 it's just to solve an argument or um, deal with stress or something. It's not the same as somebody who's engaging in patterns of abuse and control. And what we found is that these, and domestic violence researchers have been writing about this a long time. They've written about these abusive parents using children as weapons, right? You know, using weapons to control the other person, like abusive fathers, for example, saying, I will hurt the kids if you leave, or you'll never see your kids again if you leave the house. And then researchers who studied men who were victims of battery reported the same thing. And so the domestic violence literature was documenting this for a long time. Uh, and then when people started studying it who are parental alienation scholars, they took those same behaviors and we just call it something different, but it's the same thing. We're calling the use of the children parental alienating behaviors because we're interested in how it affects the kids. We're interested in what it means for children to be a weapon. How does that affect the kid? And so we use a, just a different label, but we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about abusive behaviors of a parent that are using a child to hurt the other parent. And so, so I think people get caught up in terminology and it's important to understand that what we're talking about is the same thing that domestic violence people have been talking about. It's not some unique unicorn, you know, thing over here. It's the same behaviors. Okay. And then we just call them alienating behaviors because we look at how it affects the kid. Well, given that, how commonplace is this? How commonplace is parental alienation in society? Is it like a rare thing that hardly ever happens or? I think it happens about as often as we see coercively controlling abuse, right? Um, which isn't as common as other kinds of abuse, right? Um, so, um, you know, I've done some prevalent, I've, I've done a few studies using representative samples or samples that have been selected to be representative of the population. It's about 22 million adults in the U.S. Um, are being moderately to severely alienated from their children. Now that is, that is, and that's using different methods. So I've kind of, I've hung my hat on that figure because I've used that just by looking at self-perception of whether they think they've been alienated. And then in a different study, not using their self-perception, but just ratings of behaviors. So not asking them, do you think you're being alienated? Because actually what we found is actually a lot of people, when you ask them that, there's a lot of people who were being alienated who actually weren't. And there's a lot of people who weren't being alienated who said that they were but they were actually the similar proportion. So they kind of wash each other out, right? But um, I think it is more accurate to use, instead of just asking people, because there's still a lot of misconceptions about what it is. Um, instead, it's, I think it's more important to look at the, um, what people say is happening, you know, what kinds of behaviors are happening and what, what, are, what are their children doing, right? <laughs> How are their children acting? And when you look at it that way, yeah, it's about 22 million adults um, and, but not all their children are being are alienated, which is a good thing. That means that only a small proportion of children actually do become alienated. Um, based on the measurement that we use in one study, it's about 3.9 million children um, in the US. Um, now, other people would say that maybe it's more like 1% of children. Um, I think ours was like 1.4% is what we estimated. Um, 
you know, and, and other estimations, not using population statistics, but looking more at like how many people get divorced and how many people are high conflict and how many people have abuse. And um, that's how like Dr. Bill Burnett's tried to estimate it. And Rick Warshock have tried to estimate it that way. Um, they come at about 1% of children. I, I, mine came to like 1.4 um, and that's not including siblings because <laughs> we only ask people about one kid. Right. So, um, so it could be if there were multiple children, some might be alienated, some might not be, right? And so um, it's hard to know, but it might be more than 1.4%. Okay. So that gives now, you at least a ballpark estimate. <laughs> You know, that's what we're dealing with here. But that, that's three times as many kids as have autism. Okay. That's, Just to give you some perspective. Yeah. Which, you know, we throw millions of dollars to studying autism and no money to study alienation. That's interesting. That's a very, yeah, that's a very good way of looking at it. Now, it's it's been claimed by some that parental alienation syndrome is junk science, that it's not real. Uh, it's not in the DSM-5. Um, so how does someone respond to a claim when they say that there's no such thing as parental alienation? There's no science behind it. Well, I always just kind of roll my eyes at that because it means that they have, it's, I think it's kind of willful ignorance and it's people repeating back what they've been told. And clearly they haven't done a literature search in the last 10 years. <laughs> um, you know, I publish in the top psych journals psych science journals, not just opinion journals. I publish in Psych Bulletin, I publish in Current Opinion in Psych Science, Current Directions in Psych Science. I mean, so, you know, that that's ridiculous that people would say that. Um, I'm doing a review right now of, um, we're about to submit it for publication um, in, a, in probably the next two months. We reviewed all the research, scientific research that has data Right, you know, so people who've actually collected data from around the world. I mean, there's like at least 40 studies in other languages that we had to translate. Um, and so, you know, right now, I mean, we're looking at, and this is just going through December, 2020. Um, I mean, there were over like 240 studies, you know, studies with data um, and looking at alienating behaviors. I mean, just even alone looking at alienating behaviors, there's over 50 studies looking at just that using many different methods, many different sources of data. Um, so for example, sometimes parents, sometimes children, sometimes case reviews, um, they're using interviews, they're using archival methods, they're using surveys. And if they're all, they're all coming to the same conclusions. So if you try to say that it's not scientific, despite the fact that there's lots of studies published in peer reviewed scientific journals, they're using different methods with different labs and different samples and they're all coming to the same conclusion that is just ridiculous if somebody says it's pseudoscience so what, what are some of the key papers uh in this area that you would direct someone to uh, that just you know uh, your papers obviously are some of them but are there other researchers that we should be looking for on google scholar which is a great resource for looking up papers um, yeah, I mean, there's like Bill Burnett has published a number of really good ones the last few years looking at um, the impact on children, um, particularly on their splitting of attitudes, the lack of ambivalence that children have, and, and differentiating those children from kids who've been abused in other ways. And they find that, you know, children who've been alienated are more likely to have, um, you know, very polarized attitudes towards their parents. Kids who've been abused don't. Kids who've been neglected. Kids who've, and Amy, Dr. Amy Baker published in the last like four years, she's published two papers. One looking at um, children in foster care. And when they ask them, um, what do you want? Like, or what do you most want? They wanna go home. They wanna go home to their abusive parent. <laughs> and they minimize the abuse. And, there's, and they want to maintain that relationship. Um, there's another paper Amy Baker wrote, it was published about two years ago, where they surveyed child protection workers um, and they asked them to go through their cases. You know, so these are, and they asked them to select their most severe cases. And so their responses represented like 10, like I think 10,000 cases that they were reporting on. And they asked them to rate the cases on how the children felt about their parents. 
they didn't say this is an alienation case. They didn't say anything. They were just, because <laughs> it wasn't an alienation case. It was a case, it was a study looking at children's attitudes towards their parents who were abusive. And what they found is almost very, very small, like almost no children hated those parents. They didn't want to see them. Almost all of them engaged in attachment enhancing behavior. They wanted to be with this abusive parent. And what that tells you <laughs> is that that's the difference between estrangement. Right. Those children have a legitimate reason to dislike a parent and yet they don't reject them. They have a legitimate reason. These are kids who are in foster care, who, whose parents have done the worst things to them that CPS has had to get involved and have been flagged as the worst cases of child abuse. And yet those children were not, they were engaging in attachment enhancing behaviors. I published a few reviews of papers. So um, that, that can give you an idea of what articles would be useful. I mean, I think it depends. I mean, there's so many papers that are published on different pieces of it. I mean, if you're interested in alienating behaviors, there's some beha some papers that would be good. If you're interested in outcomes on children, there's other beha other papers you'd want to look at. Um, if you want to look at um, uh, the how courts and other people deal with it, that's a different set of papers. There's other papers that have looked at how it affects parents. Um, you know, so it's hard to give you an answer on which paper to point right. you to because <laughs> I think it depends on what angle you're trying to get at. And then we're uh, just to uh, let my listeners know, we are creating a, a, a link on our site of research papers that maybe we'll reach out to right. you to figure well, out. One, one, place, one place that you may want to look because uh, Bill Burnett has created a whole database of alienation behaviors um, in or, uh, papers. Anything published on it is at, um, at Vanderbilt University. And he's got them all there. They're not all annotated. Um, he's working on trying to annotate them. Um, so you may want to reach out to him because he's got um, that database and then he started preparing a list. He's annotated books that have been written by parents and books that have been written by clinicians. And it's on the PASG website. So if you go to www.pasg.info, um, there you'll find the what he's pulled together so far. Um, and he's it's an ongoing project because there's so much to write. You know, there's so much to summarize. There's so much research out there. And so, um, but that would be a good resource because he's got the database. Um, the, the hard part is it's hard to get access to the original articles because there's copyright issues, right? So. Yeah, so uh, that's why I'm hoping on my website just to have like brief little summaries, like brief abstracts mm -hmm. so that people can know what they talk about. And if they really want it, they can go to the library and, and yep. get a copy of it. Um, so one, I know that you are an advocate, uh, as are many in the parental alienation scene, of joint parenting. Uh, why is joint parenting important for children? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't really say I'm an advocate. <laughs> I, I'm president of the International Council on Shared Parenting, but I'm I'm there as a the the, inter, the International Council on Shared Parenting is not an advocacy organization. It's actually a, an organization that's a combination of advocates, scientists, and clinicians. And the mission of ICSP is to um, disseminate research and best practices for children undergoing separation and divorce and identify when shared parenting is beneficial and when it's not, right? You know, because there's times when it wouldn't be appropriate. And so, so my goal is that, or, you know, our, our goal is not to advocate, right? But, but we do sometimes get involved, right? You know, so we'll, we'll sometimes sign on to different things and different initiatives that are going on that, um, because we believe in the science that backs that or things like that. But um, just to be clear, that that's the role of the ICSP. Okay. Um, but we do have members who are advocates and whatnot. Um, and, but, you know, based on the scientific research on shared parenting, we do know that even in high conflict families, shared parenting or quality time with both parents is really important for children and their outcomes. It is in their best interest um, because, you know, when you, when you undermine an attachment to a parent that a child has, that's devastating, right? It's, 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 
that's a grief. I mean, when people, I mean, people talk about how devastating it is to lose a dog and they don't seem to think that when you lose a parent, it's any worse, right? You know, it's, it's amazing to me that they just kind of downplay that. Right. They don't talk about what it means for children to lose all that a time with a parent that they loved before um, and still love deep down, you know, but they're being denied that relationship. Um, and so, and, you know, a lot of these children are not allowed to grieve that you know, parent. And so, um, you know, so that quality time is so important to maintain an attachment, you know, and, and even when alienation is going on, if it's like mild and moderate alienation, like it, that, that quality parenting time with the parent is so, with both parents is so important because it'll, it, it, it can mitigate the damage that the alienating behaviors are doing. Once that parent starts to lose that parenting time, they start to lose power and they start to then, you know, have less influence on their child. The child starts to see them as not as important and they don't, their, their authority is undermined. Um, and so that quality time is essential, right? And, and even like if there's been a long time when the children haven't seen that parent, a lot of times they'll order reunification therapy but not order more parenting time, which is really crazy. Like they want to move slowly and that's not how it's going to work, right? <laughs> it, won't, it won't work that way um, because children, you know, you need to move immediately to having quality time with the parent to, to repair the attachment. Um, now the therapy of course is still important, right? But if that parent's safe, there's no reason why there shouldn't be more parenting time. Um, now, obviously when, when alienation gets really bad, or if there's severe domestic violence in other ways, right? Severe child abuse, you wouldn't do shared parenting, right? You know, that doesn't make any sense. You would never do that because the child's in danger. The child's um, being abused. Um, and so, so, you know, children have been severely alienated. Um, that's when you would need more of a child protection response. And that's when shared parenting would not be appropriate. Okay. Now, in an extreme case of parent alienation, uh, say it's gone on for years and there's virtually no, no contact. What kind of mental health issues are there on the child in that particular case? Because the alienating parent will say, well, they're fine. They just choose not to have a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can look like they're functioning well and, and achieving mm -hmm. well. But what, what are some of the long-term consequences? Yeah, um, the, well, the long-term consequences are the same that we see with kids who've been abused in other ways because it's child abuse. Right. Um, you have in this case, though, you have um, unresolved grief, so or ambiguous loss that the child has about losing this parent. And the child also has this deep psychological split that happens where they deny half of who they are. Um, they because because they hate this parent that they feel abandoned them and never loved them. Um, or that is they feel is unsafe, even though they're not unsafe. Um, and so I just published a paper last, last month where um, we described the losses that children experience who've been alienated. And those losses then are directly tied to those other long-term impacts, right? The anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress, um, externalizing behaviors like ADHD, um, substance abuse disorders, a lot of other personality disorders children develop. Um, because of the trauma associated with this. Um, but what, what, what feeds into that are these losses the child's experiencing that predispose them to all these other things. Um, because what happens, it's like a chain of events that occurs. So the alienating parent engages in behaviors to make the child feel the other parent is unsafe, never love them, and abandon them. And so this child is hurt by that, right? You know, they, they're because they love them, right? They were very attached to them. And when a parent is telling them this other information and creating a new narrative about that, what's the child starts to not trust their own feelings and their own memories. And they become disconnected from their feelings. They don't trust their own memories. And that has been documented by research looking at adults who are alienated as children. Like they essentially feel like they are disconnected from their emotions. Um, they've had to dissociate from it because they couldn't trust them. Like they're, 
what they experience is not genuine, right? Um, and so, and then that disconnection, we, we call that, we labeled that a corruption of reality, which I think is a useful term to think about it because their whole reality, their whole world is corrupted then, right? Because they, they don't trust their feelings and thoughts and memories. Now they see everything in this very warped mm. worldview um, that the alienating parent has imposed on them. And it, this is kind of at the foundation of the brainwashing that happens that a lot of researchers have documented. And then what happens then the child loses their identity, right? They lose the sense of who they are. They become completely wrapped up in pleasing the alienating parent. Um, they become enmeshed is the word, but I, I prefer to use a different term of um, identity fusion, which is a different theory in social psychology where the child essentially fuses their identity with the parent because at that age, they don't have an independent identity yet, right? You know, they're, they're still very um, malleable. They haven't really developed a separate identity. And so they fuse with the parent and become essentially like a family unit, you know, or a parent-child duo. <laughs> and then sometimes, sometimes they'll bring the other siblings in. And research on identity fusion actually started looking at terrorist groups and other types of really extremist groups where you know, people will, or cults, you know, where they'll, the people's identities just kind of become part of that cult and they don't, they can't separate themselves from that. They see the world as very black and white, that it's us versus them mentality. And that's the way alienated children think, right? That's the way that they approach. They think anything that the alienated parent is trying to do is to tear them away from the alienator. Um, and they will defend that person, right? Um, and so it makes sense that that would explain what you see in these families where there's alienation. Um, so the kid has no identity, you know, they, they struggle with that. So in this, so their, their developmental needs are not met when they become adolescents, they can't separate and learn who they are. So when they become adults, they struggle with not knowing what they wanna do, who they are, what are they passionate about? They can't separate their needs very well from other people. Um, they have a hard time forming relationships and they, they learn that they can't manage conflict very well because they avoid conflict altogether, right? It's like the minute they feel conflict, they cut that person off. So they don't form healthy friendships and healthy relationships. Um, then they experience obviously the loss of the parents. So they have all this grief around that. Um, and then they disconnect half of their identity because they think that this parent's bad. And so they won't acknowledge things about themselves that are positive about that parent, right? Things that are part of who they are. If somebody says, oh, you look a lot like your mom or dad, yeah. they're gonna say, like they're gonna try to disown that entirely. And because they hate themselves because they hate the parent, right? You know, And so they hate part of who they are because of that. And that's horrible, the level of self-hate. So that impacts your self-esteem. Um, and, and, and I think one of the hardest things, and this is something we see with um, abused, children who've been abused in other ways as well, is they can appear to be functioning pretty well, right? Their grades might be okay. They might be doing really well in their sports or, you know, other things, but it's, that's not an indication that they're not suffering, Right, because there could be, there still could be a lot of psychological um, issues going on that have not been addressed, um, and these children are often really struggle emotionally and with their relationships. That and a lot of people don't see that. It, it just looks superficial, like they're doing okay. Um, and in fact, I know some clinicians who've worked with children who um, work work with families where they repaired the alienation. You know, where they they got court intervention. They were able to repair it. And they noted that these children who are adults or almost adults, once they were in the safety of the parent who was the alienated parent and they repaired it, they, they, they regressed back emotionally to the time when before all that had happened. So you had 16 year olds wanting to sit at their feet of their mom and have her braid their hair for hours, right? Or a 20 year old watching back-to-back -back shows on My Little Pony, right? right. I mean, you know, it, it, so it's interesting because we see that too. It's, you know, substance abuse and other things. People say like when they recover, they kind of are always stuck psychologically at the point when that trauma happened. And so 
so that's an indication, I think, and, and further support for this idea that these children are, they might on the surface appear like they're doing okay, but they are not, they are stuck. And then the long-term consequences like um, Verrocchio um, and colleagues out of Italy, they've looked at more long-term consequences on children um, as, you know, so when they hit college, what kinds of things do you continue to see? And so you see anxiety and depression, and suicidality and other types of things. Um, but those are the downstream effects of all of that. Wow, it's incredible. I, given all of this, what do you, why do parents become alienators? Um, are these, would these people be sort of people that score higher and sort of, uh, I guess what's called the dark triad, narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, are, are they most more likely to use parental alienation or could anyone, mm -hmm. uh, like are there certain tendencies that would draw you more toward that or, you know, is it just anyone is possible, it's possible for anyone to become an alienator? Mm -hmm. um, well, so far the research is consistent with what we see with batterers. There's pathology, right? Um, so now somebody who's a mild alienator or doesn't really know, like um, Doug Dar or Dr. Darnell used to call them naive alienators. These are people who kind of, you know, maybe through, because they had it modeled for them as a parent, you know, their parents maybe alienated them. And so they're used to seeing that as a behavior. So they do it themselves and they may not be aware that they're doing it, but that's only in mild cases. Um, because it's usually more like guilt tripping the kid, you know, and they may not know that they're guilt tripping them or their nonverbal behaviors, maybe to tell the kid that, you know, hey, I'm not comfortable with you saying you miss your dad, right? <laughs> or your mom. Um, and so the kid starts to feel, you know, conflicted about it, right? Um, but that would be in a mild case. So the ones that become more moderate and severe, the person has to engage in more active behaviors meaning that they kind of, they know what they're doing, right? There's intention behind it in order to be more severe. Um, and it's usual, and to be an alienating behavior, it's patterned. So you see these behaviors over time. And so when you show, when you can see that these people are doing different behaviors over time with intent, that would imply that the person is deliberately trying to hurt that person, right? And so then you have to look at why are they doing that? Um, you know, a lot of researchers looked at hostility, you know, unresolved anger. Even when the other person got remarried, they're still harboring all this anger and all this stuff against the person. Um, but it's usually deeper than that, especially as it gets more severe. Usually there's pathologies of that parent, just like with a batterer. Um, you know, they have oftentimes personality disorders um, that are difficult to treat. Um, you know, if it's just pure narcissism or just pure borderline personality disorders, most clinicians I know, it's hard to work with them, but it's not impossible. But usually with alienating parents, it's mixed with some um, antisocial personality disorder um, or yeah, some machia, you know, if you look at the dark triad or some, some have added the tetrad, they add another one. Um, in that case, you see like kind of Machiavellianism and kind of much more um, deliberate planned attacks on a person, right? You know, and no regard for the law. Um, you know, they don't care about the court order because they know it's not going to get enforced or no one's going to do anything. So they don't care, you know. Um, there's no incentive for them to comply with the order. I mean, you know, why would they do that, you know, if they know they're not going to be punished? And so, those folks, though, are the hardest to treat. You know, you can't, antisocial personalities are really hard because um, they don't, they're not incentivized by anything other than punishment, right? You know, or, you know deterrence is really kind of all that motivates them um, to, to not do a behavior. Um, we know that for people like, for example, who are just in, in prison, you know, I used to do criminal justice work and antisocial personalities, I mean, you're dealing with people who they only do something because they don't want to get in trouble, right? You know, so, um, and so those, that's kind of usually what you're dealing with. Um, or it's also a parent who's also has a lot of unresolved trauma and they are projecting it onto their child. Now that's not either or, you know, sometimes there's unresolved trauma and personality disorder. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that somebody who's like just depressed or bipolar, you know, that's not, that's an access one disorder. That's not a, 
and and there's a lot of people with personality disorders who don't alienate their children too. So we can't, you know, we can't we can't equate that like saying that somebody who's got a personality disorder is by default an alienating parent. That's not the case. But usually, there we do know there's intergenerational pieces to this, just like other kinds of abuse. You know, if if you've been alienated, chances are you might have been alienated in the past, or your ex was. Um, and or you know or they had it modeled for them right right um, yeah or you know and then unfortunately then that means then your children have you have to break the cycle of abuse in order to stop right. it um yeah so oh very interesting well i think that wraps up my uh, my questions and uh, i really want to thank you for your time and i hope that you know maybe in the future when we have further questions we can always uh get back in touch with you and uh, yeah, um, thank you very much and best of luck in your future research and I look forward to seeing your future publications. All right, thank you.